looks at us. We know that's the signal. The shooters jump out. This kid's dancing. All of a sudden, he gets hit with about 12 shots. Bam, 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 bam. I don't even know what the cops were doing. They were probably ducking, you know, with all the shots that were going off. They jump back in the getaway car. They drive, and I'm right behind them. I'm a crash car. I saw the whole thing happen, but now if any of these cops give chase, I got to crash into them. What's up, everyone, and welcome to the Wide Awake Podcast. My name is Joshua Rubin, and I'm your host. Are you ready? Today, my guest is Larry Mazza. He is a former hitman for the notorious Colombo crime family. He was the protege of Greg Scarpa, who was a hitman that also worked for the Colombo crime family. It is estimated that Greg killed over 100 people, and he was nicknamed the Grim Reaper. Welcome to the studio. Well, thank you for having me. I want to thank Michael Dowd also for our introduction. Uh, and yeah, I was with the Grim Reaper. He was uh, probably the most prolific killer to ever come out of the Colombo family. Uh, there's a long story behind that. Uh, I wasn't really a hitman, although I did participate in hits. Uh, it was part of the life, but I never did it for money. Uh, like people would believe a hitman does. So the newspapers made that bigger than it was. Mm. And I mean, before we get into any of that, I think just to lay the foundation, I want to know where do you come from? What was your childhood like? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I've, I've, I've done several of these shows and uh, other people have come back and said it was almost like Leave it to Beaver, a old TV show like Happy Days. Grew up with a, a, a father who was a lieutenant in the fire department. My mom worked... Uh, I went to Catholic school. I was an altar boy. I was an athlete. I was in different, uh, you know, uh, organizations, all for the good. There was no reason for me to get into the life I got mm -hmm. into. I had a perfect upbringing. Uh, my parents were wonderful, just like all the kids I grew up with. Great parents that would do anything for their kids. And when you were younger, what did you think you would become when you got older? What did you want to be? Well, you know, uh, obviously our parents have big plans for us. And my father always said that I could have been a, a lawyer, a doctor, anything I wanted to be. But after high school, he saw that I wasn't really committed to studying and all of that. So we, you know, their game plan changed and it also became mine was to follow his footsteps and become a fireman. And if I had done that, there's no doubt in my mind, I would have made chief. I would have worked my way right up to the top and been the chief. The kind of person that can just get into anything and become very good at it. Well, I'm driven. I, I like to be the best at whatever I do. And unfortunately, it made me a pretty good gangster when the time came. Uh, but yeah, I, I, anything I did, I wanted to be the best, whether it was sports, whether it was work, whatever it was around the girls. I wanted to have the prettiest girl. I always drove myself to be the best. Uh, my father once said I was a sore winner. Even when I won, I wasn't happy. So I keep referring to him because, you know, uh, he just passed a couple of years ago. I'm sorry about that. No, I, I, you know, I appreciate that. But, you know, he had a different plan for me. He did everything possible for me, mm -hmm. as my mother did. But, you know, things happen. And we'll talk about, I'm sure, the path I took, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So when you were about 18 years old, mm -hmm. 17, 18 years mm -hmm. old, you met a girl called Linda. Yes. A woman named Linda. Yep. Can you tell me who she was and how you met her? Well, you know, you hit you hit it uh, right. I was about 17. I wasn't quite 18. I was working in a, a, a grocery store or a supermarket called Danza's. They had like 11 different stores. And I had various jobs from in the store to delivering groceries. And on weekends, that was the main thing, delivering to houses. And I started delivering to her house. And yeah, she was about 31, 32. I was, like you said, not quite 18. And she was a beautiful girl, uh, lady at the time to me. And little by little, she got more and more friendly. And I got friendly back. Never really believing it would become something. Uh, but it did. Eventually, I would deliver to her house and she would invite me to sit down and offer me a drink. Uh, which while I was working, I didn't have a drink. I would have iced tea or, you know, a soda. Uh, plus I had to go home because I had jobs, other jobs. I had, uh, I was, uh, you know, in a martial arts uh, academy and I was a football player at high school. 
So I was always weightlifting and I wasn't thinking about drinking at three in the afternoon. So anyway, uh, eventually after a few times of meeting with her, you know, uh, she sort of opened the door by asking me pretty bluntly if I fooled around. And I took it a little personally. I says, of course I do. What do you think? You know, and I said something silly, you know, but it's in my book and I'll say it again. I says, what do you think? I'm gay. You know, and you know, nowadays that's a bad thing to say, but when I was a kid, mm. I said, of course I fool around. So she, uh, asked me to come over her house a few times. And at first I was reluctant. One day she called me uh, at the gym. I was at the gym and uh, I go to the phone and she asks me to come over that night. And up to then, I never really gave any thought to her marital status or if she had kids or anything like that. Although I knew she had kids from delivering there, you know, she would make comments and she had to pick up the kids from school or something like that. So I knew she had kids, but you know, Maybe she was separated, the boss. Anyway, that night she asked me to come over. And when I went home, I took a shower, got all cleaned up nice. I had to ask my father to borrow the car. And <laughs> yeah, that's again, you know, this is, it gives you a time frame. I was, you know, I didn't have my own car. And he gave me his brand new Buick Electra 225. He says, oh, go ahead. I said I had a date, whatever. So I went to the house and, uh, when I walked up the steps, she was dressed in a, a you know, real nice one-piece black outfit with a zipper that ran down the whole front. And I walked in the door and, you know, we, we kissed, a uh, quick kiss, hello, like we knew each other a hundred years, you know, like this was something that was going to happen eventually, you know? So I sat down on the couch and I remember seeing uh, an ashtray. What a joint, which I had never spoken. I don't think I even saw a joint at that point in my life. Not even, I could say that. I never even saw one. And there was a bottle of wine. The infamous M&Ms that I've spoken about so many times were on the table. And we sat down and uh, had some small talk and sipped a little bit of wine because uh, that was more or less my speed at that time. And you know, within an hour or so, we were just starting to get hot and heavy. And uh, that was the start of it. And it just grew and got more and more intense uh, and very serious. It wouldn't have lasted 10 years. So, uh, you know. Jeez. And how long were you seeing her for before you realized or found out who her husband was? And how did that happen? Okay. Well, now that we were uh, having an, this relationship, she started sprinkling out that she has a husband. We had to be careful. I said, okay. You know, uh, maybe some kids would have ran. Maybe some wouldn't have. I don't know, but I didn't run. And eventually she started telling me as we got real close, this took months, okay, that maybe it would be good for me to meet her husband. That's when I started getting a little, no, there's, there's something wrong here. I said, I can't meet your husband. I mean, we're having an affair. How am I going to be his friend? You know, no, it's crazy. But I think there was a point where she told him, and it'll all come together as we tell this story yeah. as to why that's a possibility. But I think she told him maybe three, four, five months in. Because after, you know, getting closer to a year, she was insisting that I meet him. He could help me. Uh, you know, we, he could put you in business, he'll make your life wonderful, you know, all kinds of things that a kid, you know, starts eating up to some extent. It sounds like the perfect setup. Yeah. It's like, you get to sleep with my wife mm -hmm. and I'll give you some money, get right. you a job. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, my father, referring to him again, said later on, he doesn't know if he could have turned that situation down. So anyway, after about a year, I do... She was married. I knew, I, I still thought he was a traveling salesman or something. She never told me exactly who he was, but she wanted me to meet him. So that night that we met, finally, they had put together a business, uh, uh, a supply company a fire, to do fire extinguishers for businesses and, and sell them paper products and bathroom supplies and cleaning supplies, you name it. It was a supply company. And I was going to be the sales manager for the whole East Coast. So it sounded too good to be true. 
Uh, and with that, I, I sort of moved away from the fire department. I was on the list. Okay. Uh, although something happened with that, that it was going to be a long delay. So it was almost perfect timing that I could take this position. Mm. I spoke to my dad and my mom about it and they said, well, sounds good. You know, you're getting in on the ground floor. Who knows where it can lead? So tonight I have to meet him. I'm nervous. I still don't know who he is. She just told me he's, uh, influential. He knows a lot of people that could be anything, you know? So the night I'm going to meet him and go to dinner and meet the other partners, I get to her house a little early. She says he comes home about five o'clock. So I got there maybe four, four thirty, And I remember needing more than a wine. So I says, you know what, Linda, I'm going to have that vodka. So I started sipping the vodka and I'm looking out the window, waiting for the car to pull up and cars are going by. Finally, a big black Fleetwood. It's like a limo. Tinted windows, spoke hubcaps, slowly pulls into the driveway. So now I know it's him. He parks, gets out of the car, and he's dressed like people saw John Gotti or, you know, uh, Bugsy Siegel. He had a sport jacket on, beautiful shirt. I could see the jewelry. And he has sunglasses, although it's dark. You know, in the wintertime, it gets dark early. He didn't need sunglasses, but he had sunglasses on. And I've described his walk to the door as I'm watching him. It wasn't a walk. It was a swagger. He had a walk about him that I looked and I said, this is not a doctor. This is not a traveling salesman. Uh, You know, being in Brooklyn, I knew about mob guys. I knew about, you know, social clubs. Uh... So I said to myself, or later on, if you put his picture in a dictionary, it would be on the mobster. This is what he should look like. He comes up the steps. I open the door. I put my hand out. I says, I'm Larry. And he puts his hand out and says, in a very deep voice like Barry White, I'm Greg. I shake his hand. But the funny thing was, all along, I thought his name was Charles Shiro. Too much for me to get into that story, but she told me his name was Charles Shiro. It's a whole, it, if we do part two, I could tell you about that. I, I don't <laughs> want to deviate too far. That's okay. But uh, so in my head, I'm saying, what the hell? So he comes in, he gets his sport jacket off. He's going to go change. But before he goes up, he comes out with two scotches. He says, here, Larry, have a scotch. I never drunk, had a scotch in my life. You know, I was a, as a kid, what do you have when you, you, you're sneaking out? Vodka and orange juice or some silly kid drink, seven and seven. So I said, all right, sipped the scotch, went down like fire water, but I didn't want him to know that. He goes upstairs, Linda comes in, and I said, Linda, he told me his name is Greg. She says, oh, uh, he just uses that name. I'm saying to myself, People just use other names. I now I'm starting, <laughs> now it's all you know. Little by little, this whole thing gets crazier and crazier. Yeah, setting off some red flags. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, we, we walk out the door after, to go to the restaurant to meet the other partners, and she grabs me by the arm like to walk with me, and I'm walking away. I say, "Are you crazy?" <laughs> and she's laughing at me like like you're laughing right now. We get in the car, and he insists that I sit in the front, but I don't. I said, "No, no, I'll, I'll sit in the back. Like no problem." And she was going to sit in the middle. So I'm sitting in the back and I watch him talking to me through the mirror all the way to the restaurant. And, you know, he was, he's very articulate. He's very friendly, uh, easy to like and fun loving and carefree. You know, Mm -hmm. he's got all the the things that, wow, it's just like going out with my, my friends. We get to the restaurant and, uh, I meet the, uh, we walk in and he has his own table. There's two bottles of wine already on the table. All the ma- the maitre d' comes over. The waiters come over to see him. Uh, the owner comes out of the back to see him. So more and more is telling me this guy is. He means you know, business. Right. He's like the ones you hear about on TV. This is mm-hmm. Al Capone or whatever. Uh, and he's introducing me as his nephew. So now they're all looking at me like, oh, my God, Larry, nice to meet you. So now I'm starting to eat that up a little bit. And when the partners get there, he doesn't ask them for their opinion or say, I'd like to give Larry a try. He looks at them and says, Larry is our new East Coast manager. 
And they say, oh, great. They're shaking my hand. Happy to have you on board. I mean, I didn't have to take a test. I didn't have to give credentials. What a great salesman I was. I just got the job. Why do you think they did that? What do you think they saw in you? They didn't. They weren't going to question Greg. If he would have brought in a monkey and said, this is our new sales manager, they would have said, oh, great. But why, what do you think he saw well, in Greg, you? No, Greg saw that I, he knew that I came from a good family. Okay. I didn't know all of this at the point. He knew that I was in college. He knew that I graduated high school. Mm -hmm. uh, and not to uh, disrespect a lot of mob guys, but most of them don't go that route. Most of them didn't get schooling like that. Uh, and, you know, just talking to me, he saw I could speak. I, I was probably smart from schooling and everything. Uh, and he knew with the influence he would add, I would be able to flourish. You know, so, and we did, we got off to a great start. Uh, the only problem was somewhere along the way, the supply company had a huge fire and it, the whole business got burned down to this day. I don't know if it was an insurance job. Uh, you know, the greed takes over, probably figured hey, I could walk away with a half a million dollars and not have to worry about all this nonsense. And Larry could do something else. I don't know. But it came to an abrupt end. And now I was in no man's land. I wasn't in school anymore. I didn't have my old jobs. I was no longer on the fire department list. Uh, so that's where the door opened when he offered me some other things mm. to do. And you took it, obviously. Yeah. And yeah. Um, so you continued dating Linda throughout this time. Yes. His, his wife. <laughs> yes. yes, yes. Well, we weren't dating. It was secretive. I mean, the only mm. time we had together, it was a lot of time. And I'm going to tell you now why it was, it was possible for our viewers to know uh, Greg had another family, his first wife that was living in New Jersey, about two, two and a half hours away. He had four kids with that wife. Later on, I found out he had another wife in Manhattan and Las Vegas. So this guy was just live like, like a pirate or, uh, mm. the old fashioned, you know, just lived his life how he wanted. Uh, Probably had a few girlfriends yeah, like as the well. Vikings, and he had girlfriends as well. Uh, but he had all these families set up. So he was gone a lot of nights. And those nights, I was with Linda. Hmm. And in hindsight, many years go by as I got older and I start thinking about it. I think I, the fit was so good that I made his life easier. When he was gone all those nights, what's a younger girl? Don't forget, he was in his 50s. She was in her early 30s. What is she going to do every night with the kids alone? So I was... Keeping you know, her busy. Maybe a companion at one point, but it became, you know, again, it doesn't last as long as it did. Mm. There wasn't feelings. And she made it clear her feelings, and I made, made it clear too. But I also knew, where are we going to go with this? You know, uh, so that's when it really became time that she had to tell him... And he had to let me know that he knows it's going on. Mm. And that was a very scary moment in my young life. And without giving too much away, I think it's important to give some context to who these people were, right? Because um, mm -hmm. I watched one of your other interviews, and I mm -hmm. think you didn't really get into who the actual family was. The who, Colombo family? Yeah. Well, who, yeah. Who was, in a brief description, who was the Colombo crime family? Mm -hmm. What kind of businesses did they operate? Yep. And uh, who were some of the main figures? Okay. Well, in, in New York, there's five families. Most of the other states don't have five families. There's one family, and typically it branches from one of the five families of New York, where it all started. Uh, and the families are the Colombo family. Ultimately, I'm giving you the latest names, Colombo, Gambino, Bonanno, Genovese, and Lucchese. They all branch from old, old-time bosses that you might have heard about, like Profaci, uh, uh, Lucchese. Luciano, those names, mm. Joe Bonanno, that name is still the same. And basically, the families are uh, running crime throughout the state, whether it's on a low level like numbers, where I started, where most young kids start out, taking numbers, unless they're already good car thieves and somebody says, oh, we can make money with this guy. Uh, they're Shylocking, there's bookmaking, which I made a fortune in. And I became an expert. Uh, I was known as the Lefty Rosenthal of the Colombo family. The whole family was 
given me the business because they knew they'd win or earn. Uh, but they also branched out into unions. And I remember Greg once telling me that's going to be our downfall. And Greg was what's called a boss's man. A lot of people don't understand what that means. He never took a position or a title other than wise guy, good fella, official good fella. I didn't know why all along until later on, if we fast forward to the end and we find out that he wasn't the guy he was supposed to be, mm. uh, he couldn't take a position. He would have lost his, his carte blanche, and we'll get to that. He would have yeah. lost that. So he never took the position. Uh, but he was a boss's man because he was around so long. He went through a couple of wars fighting for the Colombo family. And wars, you mean, between the five families? No, no, no. Inter Interfamily wars. Okay. Yeah, interfamily. Most of the wars aren't between the families. The last one was probably a hundred years ago, what you see on TV, Joe Masseria and uh, Joe Maranzano. You know, but after that, when Luciano and the, you know, and this is history. I'm not, I wasn't there. I know it from, you know, just hearing things and seeing, you know, some good documentaries that were legit. Uh, once the five families were formed, there wasn't, it, I don't know of one where it was one family against the other. It basically is within the family itself. And the Colombo family has been at war for many, many years. You know, we're actually working on uh, a documentary about that, the Colombo Wars, because they were fighting for years. But going back to where I said about Greg, because of his status and his legendary killing and his legendary toughness, he could go direct to the boss. He didn't have to go through a captain. He didn't have to go through protocol. Uh, so he was what's called a boss's man. He had his own little, a lawyer called it a fiefdom. He had his own little kingdom within the kingdom, and he could do whatever he wanted. And when they questioned him on it, they, meaning Junior Persico, who was our boss, Greg would tell Junior, whatever I do here is for you and the family. And how did you become part of that kingdom? Because I know he was the one that mm -hmm. got you hired. Yeah. But you weren't working with him Well, really at the beginning. You were doing sales and stuff, right? Right, right. So how did you become uh, a member of his close inner circle and performing hits with him? Well, and great question. It's a great question. And it's it's and I will tell you how, but it's still hard to believe it could happen. Okay. After the supply company was dissolved, it blew up. Literally. Uh, Linda asked Greg, what are we going to do for him now? Where's he going to go? Now I'm not 18. I'm still young. I mean, I'm probably only 20, 20. I could still move on with something else. But he says, I'll bring him into the numbers business and the Shylock business. I didn't know anything about those businesses. When you're his right, I'm becoming very close to him. He's bringing me everywhere with him. He's proud of me. He likes what's going on. He likes what I'm bringing to the table. He's now bringing me into the Shylock business. I was never a good Shylock because I had a heart. Uh, but I did get involved in it. Uh, he would bring me down. What's the Shylock? Shylock business is lending money okay. at an exorbitant rate. I give you $1,000. You got to pay me anywhere between $30 and $50 every single week until you hand me that 1000 back in full. And it's a lucrative business. Mm. Greg was a Shylock's Shylock. He gave Shylock's money to put out, okay? And he made a fortune at it, but you couldn't have a heart. Guy can't come with a sob story. You don't want to hear about his wife or his kid or anything. You can't listen. If you do, you're not going to be successful. He once told me, you know why I'm successful? He says, because I'm a scumbag. That's his exact words to me. And I was having a hard time because I would have an old coach that I grew up under you know, playing basketball that now is doing business with me, sports or borrowing money. And if he Christmas time came or he was having trouble, I would say, all right, I'll see you next week. And I remember bringing a story back to Greg telling him, I let the guy pass this week. He banged the table. He jumped up. He called me a sucker and eventually told me the reason he's successful is because he's a scumbag. So it's a tough business to be in. And there were way tougher guys than me that had trouble with that business. Joe Brewster, Bobby Zam, these were good-natured guys, you know, but tough guys. So, uh, 
but getting back to growing with the sports business, traveling with him to different meetings, meeting captains, underbosses, consuliers, and being introduced as his nephew, he was now bringing me into that inner circle. Mm -hmm. he, did, he wanted me with him, okay? And he knew now, again, the cat came out of the bag at this point with Linda. We'll get back to that at some point. Uh, so we had this real tight bond, okay, that, you know, in life, that's not going to happen too often where you're okay with a situation like that. And uh, little by little, he would bring me along to more and more things that make you a serious wise guy and ultimately a, a good fellow or a made guy, whatever you want to call it. So uh, I've said this on a lot of different podcasts, and I'll say it again because it's important. It doesn't happen overnight. You're not told to kill your best friend on the first hit. You're asked to come along or you're asked to drive me somewhere, drop me off. I drop them off. The next day I hear the guy he went to meet is dead. I know I dropped them off, but, well, you know, I, what can I say? I didn't do it. Uh, finally, well, not finally, then he asked me to give a guy a flat tire, okay? Give a guy a flat tire. Newspaper says, man killed fixing flat. Now, I gave the guy the flat. I was a little bit closer, you know. But when I went to the club that day, I was getting seasoned enough, rolled the newspapers out, and, you know, I didn't even bring it up. I said, I'm not going to go in there scared and say, Greg, that guy got killed, I gave flat. That would be a bad aura. You showing know, weakness. Being, right, showing weakness, right. Eventually, you can't show any weakness. Uh, but that's a great way to put it. Later on, I knew that. But at that point, it was just, I, I, I can't say anything, you know. Then, you know, maybe you're part of a beating because somebody owes me money. They're beating this guy up for me. How can I sit here and let them do it so you get involved? And this isn't making an excuse. I'm giving you the, re I'm giving you the answer to how it happens, mm. okay? At any point... To some extent, I could have left or backed off or tried to get out of there. But I did also like parts of the life. I liked making money that way. I liked the respect or, you know, not so much fear. Uh, you know, uh, it was more respect for me at that point of being Greg's nephew. Uh, made my life easy going into restaurants. I would walk to the front of a line where I know there were people way more important than me waiting, but they let me in. You know, things like that are easy to, uh, you know, blur your vision. Uh, so it was a, a, a slow process, but, you know, you start maybe, you start maybe, uh, like I said, giving a flat tire, buy a shovel, then go help out digging the hole with his son, you know, uh, and I have a hard time talking about all those early ones because that's where I really became, you know, a scumbag and a bad guy. I, I turned on my family and my Catholic school and became a, a, a bad guy. Uh, it's easy to talk about, you know, hits and stuff that happened after the war, which ultimately I wound up part of years later because it was kill or be killed. I was in and, you know, what are you going to do at that point? But it's a slow process. And I, I think I've said in the past that I don't know if Sigmund Freud could come up with the answer to how a kid growing up like me could become a killer and do these things, you know, making the money. Yeah, I could see that, you know, hanging around, hmm. but beating up and then becoming a killer and then being like the number two guy in a war. Well, not number two guy because I was next to Greg. You know, I was that important. People were trying to kill me, you know, and saying, all right, well, I'm not going to sit around and let them do it. Uh, but it happened slowly. When did you finally have the conversation with him that you were dating his wife? Because from what I could tell mm -hmm. from doing research, that was a very stressful thing. And it was something that was hanging over your head for a long time. It was starting to eat me up. Because when I started with her, it was, hey, you know, what am I doing? You know, I'm a kid. Even though it wasn't right, I didn't know him, and if it's a secret, it's a secret, you know. Uh, then I knew she was married with kids, and there was still a relationship. There was a life, and, you know, uh, I started thinking it's a little wrong. Well, it's wrong, but I still made excuses for myself. After I met him, 
and it was still going on. Now I am really a bad guy because this, I, how could you do that to a friend? He's bringing me around, introducing me, he's putting me in business. You know, he's, he helped me get a loan for my first caddy. I couldn't go into a place at 19 or 20 and get a caddy, you know, without putting money down. Greg said, it's okay. Oh, which car does he want? Pick the nicest white caddy in the place. Uh, and I drove out with it. You know, so all of these things are now starting to bother me. And she saw it happening where I, I wouldn't come around as much. I was sort of trying to back away a little bit. And she would call me and she would, he would call me and say, where you been? Uh, I'm worried about you. Linda's worried about you. And one day he finally saw that I wasn't the same guy. And he said that to me. He said, Larry, there's something wrong. I said, you're not the Larry I met. I says, you got, your, your, your mind is not right. You, you, you seem very, uh, you're off. There's something wrong. And I was paranoid. And he sensed that, you know, because I thought eventually he's going to have to kill me when he finds out. Now that I knew who he was. And the day uh, he brought this out in the open, uh, I went to his house as always. And I left my car. It might have been Linda's car that I was using, a beautiful caddy at the time before I got my own, obviously. And I got in the car with him and we start driving and he has this conversation. He's uh, telling me that uh, he, he doesn't like the way I've been lately. I missed a couple of appointments, meetings. One was a hit that he had to do that I didn't bring him to. I mean, again, we can go on and on and on, but I want to get to your point. And he starts telling me that he he wants the old Larry back. He wants me to be the way I was. He knows Linda cares for me. Uh, you've been a good friend to her. And he says, you're a young guy, but you're very mature. He says, and the conversation I'm going to have with you now is because I think you can handle it. And nobody else can ever be part of this. He says, but I, I know about you and Linda. And actually, he this went on. The, the, the club is about, you know, maybe two miles away, which isn't far in New York, a couple of streets. So he's telling me this all the way. We get to the club, and my stomach's turning because I know where he's going with this, but he's not coming out with it yet. We go back to the office. We sit at the desk. And at that way, he tells me, he says, I know about you and Linda. So I've said it a lot, and I've always thought of that little part of the Godfather. I, it's the best way to describe it. Uh where I said, I would never admit it. But the second I admit it, I just gave him the reason to kill me, you know? But something made me, whether it was stupidity, ignorance, or just, you know, this is my moment of truth, okay? And I'm here, I'm deep in, I still love her. I love the life I'm in. And I said, Greg, you know, I have a, a lot of respect for you. I says, and you are far from an idiot to me, but only an idiot wouldn't see what was going on. And he banged the desk with a laughter and he got up and he walked, he took me outside. We started walking outside. He put his arm around me. And when we got outside, he, he told me, he says, I can understand how it happened uh, and I'm okay with it. I'm okay with it. He says, but... If anybody outside of the three of us hears about it, you and I will be killed. So that was like the first time I knew one of our rules somewhat officially that that's taboo, which is taboo in any walk of life, but more so I was. And uh, from that moment on, him and I had this bond and it grew. It grew. He liked having this secret with me. He... I liked knowing it was in the open. I didn't have to worry about getting killed. I still had my nights with her. Uh, there were times we would go out to eat dinner together and he'd go somewhere else and I'd go home with her. There were nights that on my own, I would just say, all right, I'm going to go home tonight. And he'd say, nah, where are you going? You're not coming. We'll, you know, we'll go to the house for a while. But I also was respectful of his position. I said, nah, I got to give them some time. Mm. And he would make a comment like, uh, what do we look like, newlyweds? But again, <laughs> later on, I understood. He had this whole life around him, and this was— This was just one small part of it. It wasn't that important. It mm. wasn't that big of a deal. There's no jealousy or anything like that. And again, you know, he, he 
probably had to give her something back because of his life. And did your parents know what you were getting up to at this point? No, they, they knew I was working for the supply company and I never told them it dissolved. I, they, you know, there was no questions asked. I was doing well. I never needed money. I had, you know, I lived in my own apartment down, you know, in the house, but I lived on my own. I had a nice car. Uh, and I wasn't, you know, I wasn't other than the hours, you know, because there were nights where I was out and I told them I have a girlfriend, you know, uh, but no, uh, they never saw anything with drugs. I never did drugs. I didn't come home drunk. Uh, I was still responsible and respectful. I was everything I was supposed to be, except I was starting to live that double life. And they really didn't know everything until the war of how deep I had gotten in. And, you know. and when did things start to escalate? Like, when was the first time you actually saw someone get murdered? And how did that situation play out? How did it happen? Well, I, I, like I said, I was part of the outskirts. I had to, uh, you know, uh, give the guy a flat once. I had to help dig a hole once, knowing what was going on. Uh, but I think part of the education is to make you think you're going to doing a good thing on a hit. And one of the first hits was that I was in, right on site was where little Linda, who was Greg's uh, daughter and Linda's daughter, was taken from school. Well, was, she was supposed to go to school, but the driver took her elsewhere to a park and tried to seduce her. She was only about 14 or 15. So that's a bad thing. Cut to the chase. Uh, well, nothing happened, thank God, for her and, you know, uh, her future. But that afternoon, when Greg got the phone call from Big Linda, four of us jumped in the car. Greg, I was playing cards with Larry, take a ride, Joey, Carmine, Sal. Four of us jumped in the car with him. We went to the car service. And the owner didn't want to tell us the guy's address. Greg spoke to him on the side, got the address within seconds. We went to the house, came to the door. We took him for a walk. And we gave him a beating that he spent about six weeks in the hospital. I mean, there were bones broken that I didn't even know a body had. I mean, from the head down to his feet. Uh, and I thought that was enough because ultimately he didn't rape her. But between Greg and Linda, they, they just weren't satisfied. So I remember him saying something to me, you know, we're going to, I can't, I, I got to kill this guy. I got to put him to sleep. I told him maybe in some ways it's better. It's an example, what we did to him. And he says, no, he says, you know, uh, you have a sister. I knew where he was going, your mom. And I says, no, you're right. It's his daughter. And if it had happened to my sister, uh, I might've done the same thing. I would have certainly beat the guy up. Killing is a different thing. So I was involved in that one. I was now a crash car and a getaway car right on the scene. Uh, and Greg Jr. was part of it. And the, our captain at the time specifically said that Greg Jr. and Larry shouldn't be on it. It's too personal. But Greg says, no, no, we're doing this. This is family. So that's one that I was on. I actually saw Greg shoot a guy from behind the desk Uh I knew the story as to him uh, saying that Greg was a rat and Greg put him on the spot and said, what is this that I'm a rat? I hear the guy turned white. His name was Donnie. And once he said he had no papers, I said, Greg, I got no papers on you. I mean, that's, I was just drunk talk. Greg reached in his desk, shot him right across the desk, saw his brains and blood and whatever. So I was right in the room at the time. Later on, I heard there was more to that, okay, from Greg Jr. So you, you, sometimes you hear things, uh, what they want you to hear, okay, but there's more to it. He might have told his son a little bit more than he told me at that point afterwards. But I remember ro rolling him up. It's, it's, I have a song about my life. I don't know if you heard it, the life. Mm -hmm. You got to listen to it. It's a great song. But there's a part where it says, I saw men rolled up in Persian rugs. It wasn't a Persian rug. It was a rug. But this guy, I saw him get rolled up, brought out to the car in broad daylight. Uh, the next one I was part of was uh, 
firsthand was a guy that shot Greg Jr. Uh, he shot him in the behind. And uh, uh, just a beef in, a, in, in Gregory's uh, nightclub called On the Rocks. And Gregory wasn't even looking to kill the guy. He said, ah, it's over with, you know. And Greg Sr. was like, are you kidding me? You're a good fella. You're a made guy. You got shot. He's done. And Gregory really didn't want to kill the guy because he was a local tough guy. And I think Gregory liked him in a way. But, you know, certain things you can't do. So I was involved in that one. Uh, another one was Junior Persico's nephew, Teddy, was young at the time, probably 18 or 19. And I was maybe 21 now, 22. He has a beef with a local tough guy in the neighborhood. And Junior puts, and he threatens to kill Teddy if he gets his hands on him. So he goes to his uncle. His uncle puts a a whole family thing. This guy's got to go. So the whole family's looking for him. And this was a historical hit. I'll give you some detail on this one because it's, it's, it's a historical hit. If you know 86th Street in Brooklyn, it's where Saturday Night Fever was filmed. Kids are walking up and down. They're dancing. They got their boom boxes on. There's cops on motorcycles. There's cops on horses. It's... It's almost impossible to commit a crime of any kind on 86th Street. So Nikki Black, who comes up in my life again later on, sends a message that this guy's on 86th Street, but it's impossible to do. Greg hears this through Scappy, who got the message, who was our captain. And Greg says, I'll never forget, he says, I'll take care of it. Calls Carmine, gets his son, Greg Jr., a few other guys, uh, myself, and he says, puts it together. He says, this guy's dancing over there. And Greg Jr., it, it, it's it's common knowledge now, was the main shooter on this. There was another shooter, and I was in the background. And uh, actually, I was the crash car, main crash car on this, this one. So we pull up, and Joe Brewster, ice in his veins. He's the number, probably number two killer next to Greg Sr., uh, but the nicest guy, he can't Shylock. You can't bother somebody for money, but it'll kill you in two seconds if Greg tells you to kill him. So we pull up, and hes I'm in the car with him, and he says, how are we going to pull this one off? The guy's dancing there, but there's cops all around. He gets on a payphone right next to the car. There was no cell phones back then. And he's talking to Greg. I later found out. He told Greg, but I could hear a little bit. It's impossible. Obviously, Greg told him, I'll be right there. Greg gets in this little rented car that he had as a second car at the house, because now I was, you know, uh, maybe using Linda's car or she needed a car, whatever it was. He had to rent a car. And I'll never forget it. He pulls up. We see him pull up. He makes a K-turn in the middle of 86. He stops all traffic, okay, looks at us. We know that's the signal. The shooters jump out. This kid's dancing. All of a sudden, he gets hit with about 12 shots. Bam, 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 bam. I don't even know what the cops were doing. They were probably ducking, you know, with all the shots that were going off. So they jump back in the getaway car. They drive, and I'm right behind them. I'm a crash car. I saw the whole thing happen, but now if any of these cops give chase, I got to crash into them so they can't catch the shooters. And I do it. I turn the corner. Greg is still blocking traffic. Nobody could move. We drive off, get down the street, and I'm right behind them in case somebody... Uh, gives pursuit, but we didn't have that problem. So that was not the issue. But after it's done, we drive back to Greg's house. Scappy, our captain, is there. We walk in. He gives us all a big kiss, every one of us. Now, again, I'm 22 years old, give or take, maybe 21. And the captain gives me a kiss, like a hug, like, like good job. You know, like we did something heroic. Gives Gregory a kiss, gives Bob... Uh, Carmine, all the guys that were on it. Now we're sitting there. This is a foreboding that none of us caught. Greg gets a phone call. And the kid didn't die on the site. All those shots, he didn't die. He was in the ambulance on the way to the hospital when he died. So Greg came out and his whole demeanor changed. He said what happened. He says he died on the way to the hospital. 
he looks at Gregory and me, his two closest, his son and his nephew, or other prodigal son, whatever you want to call it, if that's the right word. And he says, from now on, when you do a piece of work, I don't care how many times you hit him, you put one behind his ear. And he looks at me and him back and forth. He says, that's my MO. You put one behind his ear. This is the fatherly advice he's given us, okay? But luckily enough, he because he, he said he could have identified you on the way to the hospital, mm. okay? That's what he, you know, was worried about. The guy was always, you know, none of us were even thinking that. But in hindsight, who was calling him to tell him this? Nobody even questioned it. Nobody said anything. Oh, wow, he found this out. He's, he's brilliant. He's the, he's the master of, you know. So you're saying Greg... They think Greg's brilliant because he found out that the guy died on the way to the hospital. Well, well he's got connections everywhere. He's got yeah. friends everywhere. He's got eyes everywhere. Right, right. And Whatever it was. Maybe it was the limo. Maybe it was the uh, ambulance driver. We None of us would think ultimately where we're heading and this yeah. come out in this. Yeah, well, we'll get to that a bit yes. later. Yeah, but, um, so, but things like that, even rolling the guy up in a carpet and bringing him out in broad daylight, nobody's concerned about surveillance or anything. All this is hindsight because the guy was such a killer and killed so many people and we were part of so many murders over the years, you could never think there was anything wrong. Mm. Okay. And when was the first time that you took someone's life? You were the one well, that pulled the trigger. You were the one well, that took the life. the main shooter was the war. The main shooter. I was on a whole bunch uh, with him as a shooter, as a backup shooter or, you know, when you're with him, a backup shooter... Is, is unnecessary, but he wanted me on the scene. And, you know, I was only 28 when the war started. So during the war, I, I was responsible solely or the number one shooter uh, for taking a life. But up to that point, I was just still being groomed. I was 20, in my 20s, you know. You so were numb was, to it all. I was a cr crash car. I watched it. I was a backup driver. I I, I was a getaway driver. I, you know, uh, but uh, but it, it's all you're equally as culpable. Even if I never pulled a trigger, I still would have been eligible to be a made guy because I was on the scene. I was involved in numerous, numerous. I, I you know, there's so many more we could talk about. But and uh, what does that do to you as a person, knowing that you're taking these lives and you're just carrying on with your own? Well. Again, you you justify it. It's our life. It's our circle. This guy shouldn't have. He's a bad guy. Threatened. Yeah. The bosses. You know. You know the street. You shouldn't have threatened the boss's nephew. Uh, you shouldn't have raped Greg or tried to rape. That, that's horrible to say. Either way, you shouldn't have did this to any young girl. Hmm. You know. Uh, so a lot of it is justifiable. You think you'd like there was one that uh, he uh, m mugged somebody in our neighborhood. Okay, and we knew where he lived. Greg told Carmine, ring the bell when he comes to the door, you shoot him right there. Carmine did it. Rung the bell, guy came to the door, they shot him. I was, you know, because he mugged somebody in our neighborhood. Uh, so a lot of them are like that. But then it becomes more, now it becomes business. You know, they want us to kill this guy because he cheated on money. That's a different story, you know. And... Those started getting closer and closer. But again, years are going by. It's not like this, you kill people every day. Months, mm. six months, a year goes by that nothing happens. And then another one. So my time went by and then the war was here. And that's when now I had to step up and be the same type of shooter Greg was. Uh, and I was. And my partner Jimmy was. And, you know, a lot of things developed because of all that. So, And how many hits were you a part of and how many people... Were you responsible for taking their lives? Well, I was probably part of anywhere between 12 and 18 prior to the war. During the war, I was part of probably another six to eight. Uh, so, you know, a couple of dozen to different levels. Mm. And I know we've talked quite a lot about the hits, but I mean, mm -hmm. what was the worst one out of all of them? Well, what do you mean by worst? Um, Which one did you think this is not right? Or? Well, there's one that I wasn't part of, luckily, uh, where Greg had to kill a girl. And supposedly, 
she was going to uh, cooperate with the FBI. I don't know that that's true. I've heard it's not true. They just thought it's possible. And I remember him telling me uh, when I wasn't asked to be part of that, that this was later on. I was around a whole bunch of them. And he said to me, I know who has the stomach for this. So he took a, a tighter crew, guys that were seasoned and around him for many, many years to be part of that one. Uh, there was one that we wouldn't do, Jimmy and I, where we knew a guy was cooperating. Greg said the guy's co- Oh, no, I take it back. The guy was arrested and cooperated. We knew he was cooperating. And Greg wanted us to kill his mother. And, you know, I never, ever heard of killing family people. And we didn't do it. We just wouldn't be part of it. It didn't happen. It didn't happen. Uh, and again, in hindsight, it's so hypocritical that he would ask us to do that because down the road, and we're going to have to talk about this soon, yeah. he could have started with his own family. If you're going to start killing cooperators' families, I mean, you know. W- when did you find out, just to break the news? I yeah. mean, not the well, news, but... I'll get there. I'm, I'm going to... Yeah, you, I'm, you, so those were bad ones. Hmm. Uh, if you want to say the worst to look at or to be part of was during the war when we killed Nikki Black and, and Larry Lampese because uh, Nikki, it was personal, and he threatened to kill me through my uncle, my mom's brother. And he also threatened to kill my partner, Jimmy, uh, if he was seen on Avenue in his business. So this was personal for us. And we're lucky enough, lucky enough. Uh, I, I remember saying, God willing, we'll get him first. That's crazy statements. But when you were in at that time, we f- spotted him <laughs> during the war. And uh, I mean, I put a shotgun six inches from his head. And it was gory. It was probably the worst one I looked at. Uh, I'll fast forward to another one during the war where I was getting so frustrated. We all were. But I had made a comment. And this is now, remember, went from John Jay College of Criminal Justice, high school football player and martial artist that knows all the right ways of life, to saying, I think we need to massacre somebody because they're not getting the hint. You know, they weren't getting our guys anymore. We were, every time they showed up, one of their guys got killed on the opposite side. We were doing serious damage. I said, I think we got to massacre somebody. Let them know that this is beyond business. We see you, we're going to really do damage. So one uh, that fits that bill was Larry Lampese. He was a good fellow on the other side and fair game. And Greg shot him first with the rifle. Then the three of us got out of the car. Greg continued shooting him. I shot him with the shotgun several times. I mean, he had riddled, like almost like, again, you to, to, to compare it to like uh, the scene in The Godfather, Sonny. They just kept shooting him, shooting him, shooting him. And then at the end of it all, Jimmy put one behind his head. I mean, the guy was far gone, but just the, you know, this is. Just the statement of it. Yes. Yeah. So now, uh, and I remember that coming out in court hearings and things later on that, it, these these guys are just bad guys. But again, where I started from to that minute in time, yeah, I, I you know it's 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 hard to believe. How many bullets do you think went into him? You well, don't even know. Greg probably had eight or nine in the rifle. Uh, shotgun pellets are you know two two cartridges is uh, probably thir- fourteen or twelve pellets each. I forget what it's called. Twelve gauge meaning twelve uh, whatever pellets come out. I don't even know. But I hit him twice with that, and uh, no, it was, it was a little mini massacre, and it's it's horrible to talk about. But you said the worst, and those two were probably the worst. And how does no one hear this happening? Well, this one was three in the morning. They heard it. They heard it. We saw windows opening. Uh, the one on uh, 86th Street, there were people all around, but most people duck. Most people uh, also back in that day, nobody gets involved. Nobody saw nothing. I I don't know nothing. Mm-hmm. I came back to the scene later on. Uh, uh, and pulled up, and they were, it was surreal. I mean, there was hundreds of people, because Nicky Black was a prominent guy on Avenue. He was a known, you know, he was a, like John Gotti to his area. Nicky Black on Avenue was mm-hmm. that. And I remember kids telling me, oh, there's a mob mafia war going on or a big mob war going on. And I said, well, and somebody just, and they killed Nicky Black. You know, they're telling me like, and I'm saying, oh, man, really? You know, and I drive off. I just, you know. Stupid curiosity to see what was going on on the scene. And what would you guys do with the bodies? I know a lot of them, you left them we there. We left them. But did you ever have to dispose of any? The only one that I remember, well, there was two. Uh, 
one that the one I told you in the rug, and another one was a friend of ours that uh, got in a beef in Sammy the Bull's club, where a friend of his owned it. And this name was Tony Frezza. He was a tough, tough guy, strong, but he liked to do coke. And when he drank and did coke, he got crazy. He goes into this place and he wasn't being respectful. So they asked him to leave. Then they forcibly took him out. He came back with a gun, killed Sammy's partner, who's a good fella. There's no way he can live. There's no way. That's a rule. You kill a good fella, you're done. If you hit a good fella, you're done. So Scappy, who loved Tony, told him, get out of town. Let me see what I can do. He goes down to Florida. Scappy has a sit down with Paul Castellano over it. And he, he, I'll never forget the day he came to the club, Scappy. He says, I got good news and I got bad news. The bad news is Tony's got to go. So I said, it's pretty bad. What's good news is going to come? He says, the good news is we get to do it. Now, killing our own friend. How's that good news? Right. But the good, they, they would have tortured him. They would have left him out in the street. Okay. We put it where nobody ever saw the body again. And he was buried in in a, a place called Wolf's Pond in, in uh, Staten Island, in the woods. Uh, that came out later on when one of the guys that dug the hole became a witness. Uh, so, yeah, but no, during the war especially, and a lot of times Greg would say, you know, when you talk about these guys that chop up bodies and stuff, he made a comment to me. He says, I'm going to chop the body up. If I killed him, I want him out there. I want people to know he got killed. There's a mm. reason he got killed. He, no, nah, we never, we really, I'm, those are the only two I know of ours. I heard of others. I heard of others that he was part of, like a uh, heavyweight captain from years earlier, Mimi, Mimi Shallow or Scallow. Uh, actually, it's Shallow, but the papers always call him Scallow, SC. In Italian, it's Shallow. And I grew up with his son. He was a bad guy, real bit of a lunatic. And when he drank, he got bad too. He disrespected Carlo Gambino. They called him to a captain's meeting on uh, President Carroll in that area, downtown Brooklyn. He comes down a basement. Greg told me the story. He comes down a basement to the captain's meeting. Greg isn't a captain, but Greg was there. He was the shooter. And he said, as he walked over, he saw the whole dug already and he knew. And what he did before he got shot he spit at them, he started spitting at them. That's, you know, guy's crazy. He knows he's dying and that's what he did. He spit. Mm. I mean, most people would have tried to fucking run something. Or know? bag or, yeah. Well, yeah, maybe, maybe, you know, I don't even know if, I don't think I would do that. Nah, I'm done anyway. I'm not going to, you know, mm. but like, who knows? Who knows? You know, in that bold, you once know. you're done, you're done. Once you, yeah, but being, listen, if you're in that position, maybe you do, but maybe say, come on guys, please give me a break. Yeah. I, I don't know. Uh, who knows? And so, it seems like a long time has gone by now, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. All of this has happened mm -hmm. and things with Greg Scarpa mm -hmm. is not what it seems. Right. So when did you find out that he was an FBI informant? Okay. This ruthless yep. killer that has been on the rampage, mm -hmm. killed over a hundred people. How did you find out he was actually an FBI informant? While I was awaiting trial, I found out he was an informant. And what were you awaiting trial for? Racketeering, murder, uh, Shylocking, a million counts of conspiracies. I'm facing life. I'm never going home. And you don't know how you got into this position? No, I know how. I know how. I know Carmine Sessa, uh, the consigliere of the family who I was fighting for, became one of the first rats on the case. Uh, two other guys in the family flipped when they got arrested and they keep talking about Greg and Larry and Jimmy and Greg and Larry and Jimmy and other people. But they so the government knows now based on their informants that we are the culprits of a lot of hits during the war, not all of them, but almost all of them. So, but it's important to hear how it comes out. Okay. That's when I heard, and, and it's a lot more it pulled my heart out when I heard because I get a call from Vic Arena, the guy we were fighting, the boss of the person of the arena faction. We go in the bathroom. He's there with, uh, Frank Lastorino, who's the underboss of the Lucchese family and a friend, Mike. 
And he asks me if I heard anything about Greg. It's coming out that he's bad. He's a rat. I said, what? Greg's a rat? And he continued on this path. I went after him because now I can't accept that because that's not good for me either. And I know I'm around. This can't happen. So I had to stand up for him. The guys get in between. No, just listen to him. It's a rumor, but we heard some things. Some of the lawyers are talking. So a day or so, if that long goes by, the next day I get called in again. They got the newspaper. I go in the bathroom where we have these meetings, and Vicarina shows me the paper that Greg himself, in front of the judge, admitted or asked for leniency because of all the help he gave the government over the years. Now, I got to put my tail between my legs. What do I say now? And Vic is asking me, did you know anything about this? And I says, are you kidding me? I had no clue. I said, no, I said, impossible. I said, I still can't believe it. And he said, well, it's true. He did this in front of us. So now, but again, I was leading to this before. The government has this little frigging game plan. What was I doing on the floor with Vic at this moment in time? Now they take me off the floor. They send me back to the floor I came from. I had already been with Greg Sr. I was with him for a while. Now I'm with Ali Boy Persico, who is the son of Junior Persico, the boss of the family. And we've, we've been fighting the case. Before they moved me, we were fighting the case together. Now I come back to the floor and we're fighting the case again. And I tell him, you believe this, Greg? How could this be possible? I'm, I'm saying it can't be. It's not true. Ali tells me, I'll never forget it, his exact words. My father and I knew about him for 20 years. Now, my whole mindset is changing. I remember saying, if they knew, who else knew? And how did... So Greg's whole family knew about it? Well, he, based on what he just said, mm -hmm. they knew. That's all I know at that point. But I said to myself, who else knew? Did Scappy know? Did Greg Jr. know? He didn't. Greg Jr. had no clue either. He was as blind as I was. But I said this to myself, and they allowed this to happen. They allowed them not only to forget corrupting kids. Uh, that's the, uh, the casualties. But just to allow him to destroy the family, why would you allow a rat to be part of the family if you knew? Okay, and he said it to me. But when he said it, he turned white. He knew he made a mistake telling me that. So my whole mindset was changing. I says, you know, here I am fighting this battle to be loyal and to be upstanding. Because you didn't want a rat on anyone. Of course not. You didn't want to give anyone up. And no. now you're risking yourself right. and not for only people that, that didn't risk themselves. The other, right. And the other thing people got to realize is I would never do that while Greg and Greg Jr. were standing up doing life for two reasons. I was loyal to them, but even more than that, I feared them. And Greg Sr., not Greg Jr., Greg Sr., would kill my father, my brother, my sister, my mother. He wanted us to kill a mother, so I know that. My cats, my dog, he'd kill everybody that he could to stop me. So I'm not going to put my whole family in jeopardy. So I'm taking the lumps, and I'm going to do what I got to do. I was fighting for 20 years. I was hoping to get 20 years. I was young enough to at least have some light at the end of the tunnel. But once this all happened, now my whole the whole scenario changes. You can't kill me anymore. He better watch. He don't get killed, you mm -hmm. know. And and Gre Alley Boy knew. They all knew this. And that day when he told me that, Alley Boy, he goes to a lawyer meeting without me, which is okay. Everybody goes to see their lawyers alone. But we were fighting the case, and we were drawing up points of who was lying and points to help us. I ran across some paperwork. His final summation. He was making the final summation to have his lawyers. OK. Say that it wasn't all war. We were just part of the outskirts. It was Greg and his men. Everybody knows who his men are, me and Jimmy and some others, but basically me and Jimmy. So he was giving us up. Maybe the jury would say, yeah, it was them. You know, give these other guys a, a shot. That was his game plan. And that's a rat to do that in your closing mm -hmm. summation. He's no bargain. You know, so I always said there's a lot of ways to rat and do things like that, you know, and turn, you know, get, other guys gave up information on their plea just so they can get 10 years or eight years. And that information you gave up hurts the next guy, you know, 
That's why you're not supposed to ever admit there's a family. Junior Persigo admitted there was a Colombo family. He said, I'm a member of the Colombo family, but I'm not the boss. He was trying to save the 100 years for being the boss. So you start seeing it's it's not what, it's not do as I say. It's, or, you know, do as I say, not do as I do, mm. you know? Uh, so it, it becomes easier to start thinking about yourself. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's crazy to me that the FBI allowed it to go on for so long. I mean, how long was he informant for? 30 years. 30 years. 30 years. And during that time, he killed more 100, than 100. 100 more plus than, people. more than 100, yeah. I heard an FBI agent say it's more like 200. How does that help the FBI? I mean, he must have been giving them some, and it also makes sense now where you were going, especially you were telling me about that hit mm -hmm. earlier mm -hmm. and how he knew the guy that, was, mm -hmm. that survived and died on the way to the hospital yeah. in the ambulance. Now all those things are like, oh, how did he know that? That makes sense It now. makes sense. I'll give you another example. Greg Jr. told me not too long ago. He remembers one instance where a guy was coming in with emeralds, like a whole bunch of emeralds, a whole bunch, let's just say a million dollars worth. And he brought them to Greg Sr. first. Greg Sr. offered him 50000 It's not enough, probably, whatever the numbers were. So the guy says, no, nah, I'm going to see what I can do elsewhere. The next day, that guy got pinched at his house. The feds came and took the emeralds. Greg said, Greg, he could never confront his father. He said, Dad, he just saw us yesterday, and today he's pinched. But Greg Jr., from that day, and he told me, he said, I knew there was something wrong. But the killer that he was and the family always coming to him and him doing hits, it was hard to believe it's possible, you know? And a lot of guys said that. They thought, they knew, blah, 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 but how could he carry, a, you know, a body out like that? Or how could he do all these hits? He never said no to a hit. He, and he, you know, but going back to what you said, and in, in the light, as time goes on, you can see the FBI isn't the sacred uh, organization. They're, they're, they're still looking to rise their pay grade. There's egos there, just like we had egos in the street. They have egos. They want to be you know, the director. They want to be the director's right-hand man. They want to be a supervisor. They want to get all this, you know, money and fame. Then they all write books afterwards, just like a lot of us do, mm -hmm. you know. So they're not with, and, and they've told me, my, I had an FBI agent on the show and he says, I'm ashamed that I was- On your show. Yeah, on yeah. my talk show. Uh, I'm ashamed that I was an FBI agent. I says, it's, it's an embarrassment. He says, and people think we're smarter than we are. We're not. They only know what they're told. They're not like New York detectives or inner city detectives that have to piece crimes together. They only go by what they're told. So, uh, so it, I, you could see it, although this was blatant, but it's not the only time. Think about Whitey Bulger. You know that story? No. Okay, Whitey Bulger, you'll have to research that, was a heavyweight Irish mobster. And he had a brother who was a politician and an FBI agent in his pocket. And he did the same thing Greg did. He was probably the worst murderer in the history of Boston. He got away with it for years and years and years, never did any time. Well, he did some time. I take that back. He did some time. Uh, but then he went on the lam, and they took 20 years to catch him. I said while I was away, they don't want to catch him. They catch him, there's going to be a whole nother Greg Scarpa story, you know. And little by little, that's come out. It's the movie Black Mass. I never saw it. You got to see that. Uh, but it's Whitey Bulger. Look at that. Uh, he had the same. And what he did was, the reason he escaped, his own crew being, he would give up all the Italian gangsters. The Italian gangsters were getting pinched. And he had his own area in Boston where he was selling drugs, robbing, shaking down, shot, everything that the Italian mob guys did. And he was ruthless, ruthless killer. Look him up. Whitey Bulger, you'll see. And I'm sure there's a lot more of that mm. going on. Little by little, you're hearing more and more about who was working with the government. You know, Lucky Luciano worked with the government years ago to help them during the war. And he said, well, we're going to be patriots. If any of us went in and said, we're going to help the government, we're going to be patriotic, we'd be dead. I think when you get so big, you kind of have to cooperate in some way. Because when you get to a place where you're, I mean, you're running an extremely complex mm -hmm. cr criminal organization, you're always going to have to have the law or someone on yes. that side yeah. know what you're doing. Well, because they have to almost allow it. Great point. I'm going to tell you with another fella that came on my show, a good fella out of Boston, 
named Anthony Ariolata. He was with the Genovese family. He said, it only makes sense. It's power. The only thing more powerful in this country, not so much now, go back 20 years, you know, in the 80s, well, even more than that. So up to the 80s, go back 40 years. The only thing more powerful than Cosa Nostra was the American government. So it made sense to befriend somebody to help you. Mm. It's power, knowledge. So you want to know what they're doing. They want to give you, oh, listen, they, they're, they're watching for this. We always knew. That was another thing. We would know when they were watching us for credit cards or they were watching us for something else or they're looking for a guy. And we told them, don't come around our club. You know, so yes, you're right. And like I said, more and more is coming out uh, that it's probably the way to go if you really want to be a successful uh, life lifer in the mob. That's how Whitey Bulger got a lifelong uh, carte blanche, Greg Scarpa. And there's others. There's others. It's just not coming out. And they're probably going to keep it as quiet as possible now for the rest of them that are doing it. So going back to Greg, right? Mm -hmm. So he ratted. He's been an informant for 30 years for the mm -hmm. FBI. Mm -hmm. He tells them all this information. All of you guys, the organization starts to crumble, I'm mm -hmm. assuming. Yeah. Um, your, your head's on the line. You give them information. Mm -hmm. uh, to try and save yourself mm -hmm. because you could see everyone else was out for right. themselves. <laughs> when did you go to prison and how long did you go to prison for? I went to prison in around 92. Uh, that, yeah, right around 92. I forget the exact years because it was the end of the year. So it could have been the end of 91 and then I went in in 92. Yeah. But right around 92. And the only thing I had to give them because Greg had given them everything. Carmen Sessa gave him everything. There was nothing new I could give. So my saving grace or salvation was that I knew things about the corruption. And they came to me and they told my lawyer, because it was starting to come out, that Greg was bad, obviously, as I just told you. So they needed to know a lot. They needed detail. Who knew what? Because they were going to look really, really bad. So they started giving out some deals, They, you know, and I did. I came clean. I had to come clean on what I did. Uh, again, they knew everything already. They asked me specific questions about me and the government, and what did I know about that? They sent heavyweights from the Justice Department to see me, uh, and they asked some peculiar questions, but they were trying to get information on how deep this went. Did anybody above the corrupt agent— uh, who wound, you know, who ultimately won the case because of uh, uh, a technicality, say. But the judge was certain he was dead. Uh, it's crazy how he walked. It's crazy how he walked. Who was this? Uh, the, the agent's name was DeVecchio. That came out. Uh, and he was on trial. For uh, what? For leaking information to the mob okay. and, and, and being part of hits, telling him where, where our enemies were. Mm. And there was evidence that proved he was part of this, but Greg's Linda, our Linda had given a, a different version years earlier, uh, not years. Yeah. Maybe two years earlier, whatever, uh, that no, he's, he's good. He's not a bad agent. And the reason she did that was because she was still on the payroll. A lot of us know that now, you know, but she did tell the truth. She came clean also mm -hmm. later on. But me, what saved me was I had this information. So now I severed myself from the mob. Because you can't take the stand. You can't talk to the government. There's no way I'm going back. I don't think they hate me as much as they hate guys like Greg or Sammy the Bull or guys, you know, like that. Uh, but I did break a rule. So I'm done with the life and I'm fine with that because it, the life is nothing. It's a fraud. It's bullshit. Uh, a bunch of liars, a bunch of backstabbers, which I became one of. I became that, and I'm ashamed that I did. Uh, but I moved on, and this was the way to sever myself. In some ways, it takes more of a man to do what I did than uh, keep playing the game, so mm -hmm. to speak. So, yeah, my what saved me from a life sentence, I got 10 years, and a lot of guys that do what I did get two, three, walk the next day. You know, Carmine didn't, I think he did four years. Uh, but they didn't like me too much because of what I did gave them. You know, I was not really, uh, that useful. Yeah. I gave them their own, you know, so they had to give me something. It was up to the judge. He could have gave me more, you know? Uh, but, uh, at the end of the day, I did 10 years. And what was life in prison like? 
It's not what people think. It's the hardest part is being away from your family, your loved ones, your loved ones. Uh, uh, quite frankly, sex. I was always with ladies. I love women. I love being having a girlfriend or, or two, or you know. Uh, and then I was married, obviously. So those are the hardest parts. The actual time in the prison. You know, there are some places where maybe there's a lot of raping and things like that. I was in max places, but you gravitate to a certain group. And if you stay out of things, I never got involved with the drugs. So I was never going to have no problems with the guys smuggling in and out drugs. I didn't get involved with the the, uh, the gay guys or they call fags in jail. I'm sorry. I have to use that word, but I wouldn't use it in public. But I wouldn't be involved with them because that's not what I wanted to be looked at as or have somebody fight me because I was talking to his girlfriend, you know, in prison. Uh, I did get involved in gambling, uh, which I did my whole life. I ran the book uh, in prisons every place I went. They, You know, and they knew it. And they called me in a few, uh, one time, and they uh, asked me. And I, I denied it. No, no, no. They, they showed me cameras of them following me, handing stamps back and forth. And they told me there's a bigger line to your cell on a Sunday afternoon when football's on than the chow hall. So, but they didn't care about gambling. They said, as long as nobody gets hurt, mm. there's nobody threatened, we don't care. I mean, what are you gambling with? Are you gambling with stamps. shoes? Stamps. Oh, stamps, sorry, yeah. Stamps. Uh, you're, everybody's allowed three books of stamps, maximum. What are the stamps used for? Well, usually to send letters out, but also currency. Oh, okay, so if, yeah. if, if I gave you a book of stamps, it's $5 at the time yeah. to do my laundry. There were guys that made money doing that. They would get a book of stamps from 10 guys and do their laundry. That's how they survived prison. I survived by, you know, the gambling business. Yeah. I was an expert in it. You so were good with I, numbers. When I, yes. When I left, you were allowed three books in your possession. I had 2,000 books of stamps. Jesus. And I gave them out to people. And I sent a lot of books home over the years, too, to my ex-wife. You're like the Oprah Winfrey of prison. Yeah. <laughs> Here's a stamp. So, Here's a stamp. So she, I don't even know that. So she could, you know, sell them back to the post office, you know, 100 books at a time, whatever it was. Uh, so, but, but I, I was very much, I, I wrote my book, uh, while you were in I, prison, while I was in prison, I studied up on different things that I could do that were practical, like, you know, personal training. Uh, now I own a gym and I'm a personal trainer and I went back to teaching kickboxing and doing the things that I loved as a kid and coaching and, and things like that. So that's back in my life again. Uh, but I, I did it very, I did my time really healthy. I didn't, uh, I did no hooch, no drugs. I, I, I worked out every day, probably three times a day. I read myself to sleep. You wanted to reform yourself. Well, yeah. And I wanted and, to, I wanted to, and, and, and like I said, I wrote the book. And what was your, your relationship like with your family? Because I, I'm sure coming from well, the background listen, that you came were, from, they must've been so disappointed. Of course. But the reality is set in too. They still love me. They know I'm a decent person at the core. I like to think. And they supported me every step of the way. That's amazing, eh? Um, and, were, I mean, were they shocked when they found out about of everything? Of course, of course. When did they find out? Was it when you were into trial? When they were in trial and the, and the prosecutors were saying he's the most deadly member of the Scarpa crew, which isn't true. I mean, you know, uh, we're all equally deadly under mm. him. You know, none of us alone were that bad. But with him, we all felt the same. He can't show weakness. His own son, Greg Jr., has a heart. And he's generally a good guy. But in that life, he was cold-blooded. He would kill you in a heartbeat because his father said, this is what we got to do. Mm. You know, uh, and he did 33 years, Greg Jr. And he spent probably 13 or 14 in solitary. Jeez. Yeah, when a lot of, but he's a whole another story. And we, we have him, we're working with him. Hopefully he'll be part of what, what I'm doing as far as a movie or a TV series. Or yeah, actually, I, I would love to talk about yeah. that. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you've you've been doing a lot since you got out, right? I know yes. you said you did the gym, you've done the book, mm -hmm. yep. uh, you've got your own show. Yes. But you also worked on one of the biggest movies of all time. Yeah. The Irishman. Yep, yeah. I mean, how did you get onto The Irishman? Well, how did you work on that? You were working with yeah. Robert De Niro? Yeah, yeah. I, I'll say this, I've said it several times, and I mean it from my heart. I've been blessed since I came home. The book was well received by some serious, serious people. I, uh, I'll, I'll start with De Niro. When he was doing The Irishman, he asked uh, his security team. Several of them were New York detectives on my case, working with the feds. If they know anybody 
that can help him as a consultant. And get into character. To get that, exactly, the character of a, of a street guy that's shooting and doing these things. So they all said Larry. I, I mean, it's, it's, I take some pride in that, but also, oh, same here. So good <laughs> in shooting people or whatever. Yeah. Uh, so he read the book and he says, I want to meet him. I went to meet him. He put me in his hotel, everything first class, fantastic. Uh, and he, was, he wanted me to sit with him for an hour. I wound up sitting there for over three hours. And the only reason we cut it off is because he had to go pick up his daughter at school. <laughs> Robert De Niro had to go pick up his daughter at school. How funny, right? So he was a sponge. He listened to everything I said. A lot of things I said changed the script in the movie to some extent, about a dozen different things. Uh, I, and then I also got a small part in the movie because uh, I was very helpful to him. He called me at different times. And I played a hitman in the movie. <laughs> go figure. And... He had me meet, I went to Martin Scorsese's house. I met him also. I met casting directors. Uh, I was doing at the same time some documentaries with another producer named Kevin Kaufman. So doors were opening there. I, I was a corrupt cop in a, in a TV show called The Perfect Murder, which is funny because I know this show and you are from South Africa. Mm. And the actor that portrayed me is from South Africa. Young guy named Tommy Hugo. Great kid. Uh, I've been. He called me afterwards, and I sent him. Uh, it's just a just a great kid. I was glad he did. He did a great job. Uh, and then I met Nick Pileggi, who wrote Goodfellas and Casino. When I walked in his house, the first thing he told me, and I'm humbled by it, and it's it just a start. He says, "Larry, you wrote a mob classic." I said, "Wow, coming from Nick Pileggi." Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, you actually wrote it from I start wrote the to book finish myself. Yep. I had an editor to read through it, to proofread, make sure to protect, and they, very little they had to change. They also helped me with uh, chapters, how to line it up. We sat down together to do that. And the only part I didn't write, one of the uh, uh, detectives who I mentioned, Robert Melandich, he wrote the foreword for me because you have to describe yourself. I said, I'm not going to do that. So he did it for me, and it was very nice. So like the description on the front or the back of the book? No, you'll see it's like a prologue, not a prologue, a forward. And okay. it says, if you, it, it, the first line is, if you were to meet Larry Mazza, you would never believe his history. He grew up here. He was this. He was that. Uh, ultimately, he became a wise guy in the Gamino, in the, in the Colombo family. And uh, there's things I can't say about myself. Some good, some bad, but he, he did it. I, I put it in verbatim, whatever he said. Mm. And no, but I did write the whole book myself. It's so amazing. fast forward, uh, a man named Joe Paletto comes along and he's a producer who just got back in. He was retired for like 14 years and he's only a little, maybe a little bit older than me. I'm 62. He's probably 64, but he retired because he was very uh, successful and he was able to do it and spend time with his family. But he gets back in and he wants to, and he likes my story. So he pays me what's called option money. To, to buy the book, the rights to the book, to the story, not the book, the story. I still sell the book on my own. And I gave him the idea for Mob TV. I said, there's no, and I got it from a friend of mine. We were talking, we were saying, well, all these channels, there's, uh, you know, BET, there's this TV, there's girl TV, white TV, this dance TV. I said, there's no Mob TV. And it's such a popular genre. So he puts together Mob TV. And it can be found on Plex which is like Netflix or Hulu. You go to Plex and then you scroll down, you find Mob TV and you see all the shows. A lot of them now are old shows because it's in its infancy. I'm the first live show where we, uh, much like we're doing, I have guests on and it's in a studio. And, you know, I've had ex-cops on, like Mike Dowd, like you had. I had ex-FBI agents, ex-mobsters, uh, women that, very interesting. People are loving it. So we did two seasons. I'm waiting for the third to come out. But he brings in as a partner, Terry Winter. Now, Terry Winter wrote Wolf of Wall Street, Sopranos, um, Boardwalk Empire, The Tulsa King, the latest one. Uh, he had a co-writer with that. And I'm leaving one out. He did five that are... Uh, Very big. American Gangster. American Gangster. Yes, yeah. So he's a partner, and he just read my book a second time, told me it may be the best mob book he ever read. He is extremely interested in getting on board with 
he's already partners with Mob TV. So put the dots together. It looks like we're heading in a real good direction. I can't say much because the I's aren't dotted, the T's aren't crushed yeah. yet. There's a lot of non-disclosures, but he's very, very interested. He read the book a third time. He is no longer doing the Tulsa King. He is, and I'm hoping the reason is <laughs> because he wants to start work on the life. That's where I am at with that. And I'm going to throw this out there now. Anybody that wants to check out the life, uh, I'm the only one. Well, you can get it on Amazon, but only the uh, the Kindle version. You don't get the pictures and some. Is that what your book is called? The life. The life. Yes, you can get it at my website. It's www.larrymaza-thelife.com. You could Google search me and and see where else it will it, come up. Yeah, it'll come up. Uh, but. Hopefully, if something does develop uh, a, a big company, because when you're a first-time author, they don't really care about you. Mm. They want to. They want Nick Pileggi's book, Terry Winters. They want Nelson the Mill. Uh, any, they want really big names, right? But right. I'm sure with all yeah. the appearances that you've done now, you're getting there. Well, I am, but I'm going to wait now. Once something big develops, I mean, you know, uh, like a, a TV series comes out, then I'll pass the book along to them mm. and let them really mass market it. But I'm doing good. I'm doing okay with it. I sign every book that goes out. And just to end off, <laughs> I wanted to know what happened with Linda and what happened with, um, uh, I've just forgotten his name. Greg? Now. What happened with Linda and what happened with Greg? Yeah. Well, Greg, I'm going to tell you what happened to him the way his son said it, Greg Jr. He said that my father, meaning Greg Sr., thought he was God the way he lived his life. And at the end, God showed him who was God. He wound up getting a bad blood transfusion, and it was tainted with AIDS. Again, this is back in the 80s when he got sick, and he died a horrific death of AIDS, probably worse than cancer. Because back then the treatments weren't very right. good. Well, he had all the treatments, so he lived a lot longer than he should have because he had the money to buy all mm -hmm. these uh, experimental drugs. So he lived longer, than, but he did die in prison, and from a... a a solid 240, 230, you know, solid guy. Mm. I think he was about, I want to say he was, they said like 45 pounds when he died. He was a skeleton. They call me 45 because that's like 20 kilos. <sighs> <I'm>, well, <laughs> 80, whatever it was. Yeah, it must you be, know, yeah. Maybe but 85. Very uh, small, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> but I picture a skeleton. Yeah. That's what they were telling me. Maybe I'm off on the exact weight, but mm. I didn't see him. I heard, you know, I was still doing time when he died. Yeah. Uh, and his, Linda, everybody in the, mostly everybody has fallen apart, uh, struggled from his son, Greg's family, his kids. They're all, they, they had to make it without fathers, without incomes because everything was gone. Uh, his other son, L Linda's son, Joey, got murdered, got killed, assassinated uh, in a drug deal. You know, I hate to say that, but uh, he was involved in that and he should have never been, but the father allowed it, encouraged it. Uh, so he got what he deserved, uh, a horrific death. Greg. Yes. Linda, unfortunately, I had made a comment once uh, that she aged badly. I didn't mean that in a... What's the word? No. You're I, right back in it now. No, no. You know, because somebody, somebody made a comment that it was not nice for me to say that, but I didn't mean it in a cosmetic way that she, oh, she's not. Personality wise. Anymore. No, just health wise. Okay. She, she didn't always take care smoked, of herself. And I think she smokes from one, she started with one pack a day. She's, I heard, you know, heard she sat around the kitchen, maybe three packs a day. Hmm. She wasn't a drinker. She drank maybe like us, had a couple of glasses of wine. We, well, me and Greg were having a bottle each, you know, uh, she started drinking a lot. I think she started using drugs to help her mind, which you can, that some, some ways are worse than other drugs. Yeah. Uh, so I, that's what I meant by she aged badly. She just, and she, she didn't take apart. care of herself. Yeah. She had a heart attack. She fell. I think she broke bones in her back. Uh, just a very unhealthy, miserable existence. And that's what I meant by she aged badly. Mm. Uh, so I hope the same person who's watching, you know, your show. Understands now, yeah. Because uh, I didn't mean it that way. Uh, but her, the daughter suffered many years. Uh, you know, there's really nobody 
in the circle that I can say, and that's probably the the uh, the message at the end of the day. And and my you know the one I use is to to tell somebody you don't need that life to make a living. You can make a good living in lots, and I'm proving it right now. Uh, hard work and, and and perseverance, and you don't need that life for respect. I get more respect now because I get the same respect without fear. Nobody fears me. They don't have to fear me. They meet me and they say, man, you're the nicest guy. They, I can't believe you're a killer. I said, I'm not a killer. I said, you know, don't believe everything you read. Get to know me. Uh, I did well, you kill. did kill I did people. Kill. <laughs> I did kill, but again, it wasn't like I don't look to go do it. It's not like I did it for money, and I'm not... I'm not making it. You're not justifying. Minimizing this, yeah. or justifying. Right. I made the mistake getting in that life. That was a mistake. But outside people, of that life, I don't, I, you know, I wasn't a greedy killer. Of, it's uh, something that I find yeah. amazing because, I mean, I've sat down with, yeah. with gang members mm -hmm. and people that have killed, right? right. And killed mm -hmm. viciously mm -hmm. and ruthlessly for no reason. Yeah. And it, it's weird because people always ask me, like, are you scared? Mm -hmm. Or, how did you feel around that person? Right. And I'm never scared. It's the weirdest thing. And yeah. a lot of the people I talk to are ex. So it's mm -hmm. like an ex gangster or right. an ex mobster, right? right? And for me, it's like they're, they've become a completely different person to who that person was. Yeah. And I'm also not trying to justify anything. Right. Well, but people go, sometimes go down a bad path yeah. Yeah. and yeah. people can change. Right. It doesn't justify or right. make things right that happened. But people can change. And also the important thing too is you're not interfacing with us while we're still in that circle. Okay? You're not coming into my club owing me money yeah. or disrespecting me or, you know, where something has to be done. You know, we got to do it. You can't let the guy rob us, you know. You're on the outskirts now doing a job just like, uh, uh, you know, some of the shows you see on TV. And hopefully you get there someday because it's a wonderful show. And I think... Uh, you could see the other side of the person outside the circle where they came from. Yeah. So yeah, I see that. So I just wanted to say thank yeah. you so much for coming on the oh, show. Thank it's, you for having me. Yeah, it's been a pleasure. And uh, it was really interesting to hear your story. Well, thank you again. And let's do part two sometime. I would love There's to. a lot more we could talk about. Yeah, I'm sure. Next yeah, time yeah, I come back. Yeah. And thank you all for watching this episode of the Wide Awake Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. And I'll see you all very soon. Cheers. Oh, 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 oh,